The presentation you're about to enjoy is part of Humanities Washington Speakers Bureau program. Humanities Washington is a nonprofit organization dedicated to sparking conversation and critical thinking, and it provides many other cultural programs to hundreds of thousands of people each year. We're thrilled to be partnering with them for our free lunchtime lecture series this fall. Thanks to support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Boeing Company, the Washington Secretary of State, and many private donors, Humanities Washington Speakers Bureau presenters visit all corners of Washington State. If you'd like to find out more about Washington Humanities and events like this, please visit humanities.org. The Speakers Bureau program, and indeed all of our folio programs, are designed to generate an open and honest conversation on many topics, some of which may be controversial. We encourage differing perspectives and viewpoints, but we also ask that you treat this topic, the speaker, and each other with respect. Today's speaker, Mayumi Sutakawa, is an independent writer and curator who has focused on Asian Pacific American history and arts. Mayumi received her MA in Communications and her BA in East Asian Studies at the University of Washington. She co-edited the Forbidden Stitch, Asian American Women's Literary Anthology, which received the Before Columbus Foundation's American Book Award. Today, we join Mayumi in remembering some of the remarkable but often unsung women of the Pacific Northwest. In commemoration of the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, Mayumi presents five woman warriors in the arts and journalism whose inspiring stories reach back to the early years of our region. Drawing on her own experience as an activist and writer, she explores how these women inspired others and changed our state and our society. Please welcome Mayumi Sutakawa. So Humanities Washington likes to pose questions, which we hope that you'll think about and discuss by the end of today. Here are a couple of them. What defined feminism 100 years ago, and what defines it now? How does your cultural heritage affect your definition of feminism? So good afternoon, and thank you to Humanities Washington and the National Endowment for the humanities. I urge you to support and in, encourage your Congress people to support the budget for the National Endowment for the Humanities, which is always under fire by our administration. I would like to acknowledge that we are settled on land that was part of a Native American legacy dating back 11,000 years in the Pacific Northwest. Today I will present to you stories of women in arts and journalism in Washington in the early 20th century. They were pioneers, pathfinders, and breakers of stereotypes. And I like to focus on the 1920s and 30s, the pre-war period, as a formative time for communities in the Pacific Northwest. And I want to encourage a comparison of the political forces affecting women while sharing stories between cultural communities and recognition of women's lives across generations. In the humanities, we use historical records to study people's lives and accomplishments. The influences on these women's lives were many, the arc of history, world wars, control by patriarchal institutions, the church and the state, the family structure, conflicting points of view between foreign-born parents and their American-born offspring. And these resulted in the controls on the right to vote, to work outside the home, to marry whom wanted to, to divorce and remarry, or to not marry at all. 100 years ago, it was daring and even dangerous for women to speak out, to publish their writing and photographs, to examine gender discrimination, and to work outside the home for their own income. So someone asked me, why me? Why am I writing and speaking about this? Women's history has been one of my passions through activism, writing, and creating art exhibitions. Since the 1970s, I have presented the history of women of color and women in the arts to my community and to the public. 
I began my activist career within the progressive movement in Seattle and helped to organize a study group called Seattle Third World Women. I was in many activist protests in the International District and at the University of Washington as Asian Student Coalition president, I spoke to actually rallies of thousands of people against the bombing of Cambodia. And I wanna segue just a second here and say, I went to Cambodia for the first time only a few months ago, and the effects of the terrible bombing and the war of the 70s are still deeply felt in Southeast Asia. I co-edited two anthologies, well, no, before that, Later, as a writer for the Seattle Times, I covered the early feminist movement in Washington State and was the primary reporter covering the Washington Women's Conference, I know some of you remember this, the Washington Women's Conference and the National Women's Conference in 1977. What happened to the Equal Rights Amendment? It is not passed yet. I also co-edited two anthologies of women of color writing, Gathering Ground, New Writing and Art by Northwest Women of Color, and The Forbidden Stitch, the Asian American Women's National Anthology. Suffrage. What is suffrage? The word suffrage comes from the ancient Latin word suffragium, or a petitioner's prayer on behalf of others. The right to vote, called women's suffrage, was new to many parts of the United States when the, first, when the federal government passed the constitutional amendment granting wi women the right to vote in 1920. And we're about to celebrate that centenary in 2020. So I expect a lot of parties and rallies and cheers and banners and everything. But in Washington state, the all-male legislator voted to give women suffrage in 1883. Okay, 1883, 1920. There's a big difference there. And then again, because of political or government de uh, issues, uh, they had to vote again in 1888. This was only 20 years after Seattle was incorporated as a town with a tiny population of 1,000. Then legal maneuverings set aside the vote, and finally by popular statewide vote, meaning male voters, the state constitution was amended to give Washington women the vote in 1910 still 10 years before the national um, suffrage. Thus, Washington became the fifth state in the entire nation to provide the right to vote to women. And what were the previous four? Not states with large urban centers like New York, California, or Illinois. They were Colorado, Idaho, Utah, and Wyoming. Why? Okay, well, discuss that later. Why the, the western rural states provided women the right to vote far before the national uh, and even the urban states. And every step along the way there were political battles inspired by national women suffrage speakers such as Susan B. Anthony who spoke here in 1871 with committees of women, hearings, lobbying, leaflets, marches, these are all the same things we do, do today to achieve political change. What is feminism? The notion of feminism is probably the key building block in raising women to achieve these steps of change, like the right to vote. Feminism is a whole range of political movements, ideologies, and social movements that share a common goal. And that goal is to define and achieve political, economic, and personal equality of the sexes. This includes seeking to establish educational and professional opportunities for women that are equal to those of men. Feminist movements have campaigned and continue to campaign for women's rights, including the right to vote, 
to hold public office, to work certain types of jobs, to earn fair wages and equal pay, to own property, to receive an education, to enter into contracts, to have equal rights within marriage, and to have maternity leave. Feminists have also worked hard to ensure access to legal abortion and to protect women and girls from rape, sexual harassment, and domestic violence, changes in dress, and acceptable physical activity, such as sports, have often been part of feminist movements. Who? Today, I'd like to present to you the lives of diverse women pioneers that, of that pre-war period 100 years ago. And then you will decide if their interesting lives and achievements amounted to feminist acts. Imogene Cunningham, a photographer and chemist. Priscilla Chong Ju, an artist and shop owner. Vi Hilbert, Native American language preservationist. Anna Louise Strong, a pro-communist journalist. And Ruby Bishop, a jazz singer and pianist. Imogene Cunningham, a celebrated photographer, was born in Portland in 1883, and she was the fifth of 10 children. She grew up in Seattle, and in 1901, at the age of 18, Cunningham bought her first camera, a four by five inch view camera. She entered the University of Washington, which had been founded 40 years before. And with the help of her chemistry professor, she began to study the chemistry behind photography. And she subsidized her tuition by pho photographing plants for the botany department, such as that succulent. In 1907, Cunningham graduated from the University of Washington with a degree in chemistry. And after graduation, Cunningham went to work for the famous photographer Edward S. Curtis in his Seattle studio, learning the portrait business and practical photography. Cunningham worked on the Curtis project of documenting American Indian tribes for his famous set of books, the North American Indian, the very large format series of books, which was published between 1907 and 1930. Cunningham learned the technique of platinum printing under Curtis's supervision and became fascinated with the process. In 1909, Cunningham was awarded a graduate fellowship to study at the Technische Hochschule in Dresden, Germany, where she helped the photographic chemistry department find cheaper solutions for the expensive platinum process. At the age of only 27, Cunningham opened her own studio in Seattle and won acclaim for her portraits. Most of her portrait work included sitters in their own homes, in their living room, or in the woods surrounding Cunningham's cottage, which I believe was near the Arboretum. She became a sought-after photographer and exhibited at the Brooklyn Institute of Arts and Sciences in 1913. The next year, she married Roy Partridge, a teacher and artist. And between 1915 and 1920, Cunningham continued her work and had three children. In 1920, the family moved to San Francisco. Cunningham refined her style, taking a great interest in pattern and detail, and was interested in botanical, botanical photography. She changed directions again and became more interest in, interested in the human form, particularly hands. And she was fascinated by the hands of artists and musicians. This interest led to her employment by Vanity Fair magazine, which has been around a long time. And she was famous for photographing movie stars without their makeup, which was very revolutionary at the time. In 1934, Cunningham was invited to work in New York for Vanity Fair. Her husband wanted her to wait until he could travel with her, but she refused and they divorced. In 
1945, Cunningham was invited by Ansel Adams to accept a position on the faculty of the San Francisco Art Institute. And in the 1950s and 60s, she continued her nature photography work with other leading photographers such as Edward Weston, who photographed Yosemite National Park. Cunningham died in 1976 at the age of 93, just after her work was exhibited at a major photography festival in France. And this I just found out recently. Her archives, her entire archives, are stored at her granddaughter's house on Lopez Island. So if you are very lucky and interested, you could write to the family, Meg Partridge is the granddaughter, and see if you can visit. So there are original uh, negatives and prints, and they make new prints from the negatives for international exhibition. Very, I was very excited to go there and lucky. Priscilla Chongju was a fiber artist and a gallery shop owner. Priscilla Wong, her name then, was born in 1916 on the Kitsap Peninsula in the town of Fragaria. Does anyone know where that is? It's near Olala. And Fragaria, she loved to say, is the Latin name for strawberry. Her parents had no idea of English names, and so their older daughter asked her school teacher for a name, and thus came Priscilla. And this picture on the right, the Wing Luke Asian Museum helped me to find that. That's she and her sisters on a horse in Olala on the Kitsap Peninsula. I was so excited to find that picture. Her father was a Baptist minister from the, from the Guangdong region of southern China and a very early Chinese convert to the Baptist faith. The family came to Seattle in 1909, right at the time of the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. I know a lot of you know about that. A very large, fancy construction for an international fair, fair held at the UW campus after it had, it had moved to the Montlake site. Priscilla's mother, the daughter of a dry goods shop owner in China, was quite the op entrepreneur. And seeing all these potential customers, she decided to open a shop in downtown Seattle, which was right by Frederick and Nelson. And she brought over embroidered clothing and gift items from China. By 1931, the family opened another shop with Chinese goods as part of the Western Washington Fair in Puyallup and Priscilla ran it by herself for 30 years from the time she was a teenager. The family also managed a Chinese gift shop as part of the Seattle World's Fair in 1962. She says her mother did not speak much English but was great with customers and good-tempered and hard-working. During the Depression, the family ate a lot of sautéed peanuts and lettuce over rice. We could buy five heads of lettuce for a dime at the end of the day, she said, but after that I could never eat cooked lettuce again. Priscilla married the noted Chinese art artist, Fei Chong, who helped to organize exhibitions of the Chinese Painters Club in the International District. She developed fabric designs, and I think that is tie-dye, and exhibited and sold them. Her textile designs included block prints, tie-dye, weaving, and batik. She exhibited her work at the early Bellevue Arts and Crafts Fair, along with her husband, Faye, who showed his paintings. The couple had three children, and after Faye Chong died suddenly at the age of 61, Priscilla married Willard Jew, a noted Chinese community historian and herbalist, but he died after a few years, too. Even into her 80s, Priscilla Chongju's interest included her artwork, designing and constructing parade floats and costumes for the University District Parade, ice skating, and hula dancing. She died in 2012 at the age of 96. So, so you know what you have to do. Hula dancing and ice skating. Vi Hilbert was a Native American language preservationist. 
She was born Vi Anderson, a member of the Upper Skagit tribe in 1918 near the small town of Lyman in Skagit County. Anybody know where that is? Yes. Her father was a master canoe maker and a champion canoe racer. He and her mother spoke the Lushootseed, Puget Salish language. This is the language of Chief Self, who Seattle is named after. As the family moved from one small town to another, often as fruit pickers, her mother coaxed stories out of the native people and Vi learned and treasured these stories. After attending so many schools, as migrant workers do, she opted to enroll in the Indian boarding school in Salem, Oregon, and then finished high school there. She eventually married three times and had three children, two of whom survive. Her many jobs in Washington included berry picking, ironing, housework, running a pool hall, processing pears in a cannery, a stock clerk, a cookie wrapper for a Danish bakery, an electric welder at Todd Shipyards, cashiering at a food wagon at Boeing, a secretary at Seattle Children's Orthopedic Hospital, and a hairdresser. In 1967, she met and agreed to help the linguist Thomas Hess transcribe and translate the early Lushootsi recordings of elders. She learned to read and write this language, which she had only learned as an oral tradition, and eventually taught the Lushootsi language and traditional stories at the University of Washington. The UW Press published three of her books. Then she established her own printing press and her own publishing house, the Lushootsi Press, to continue the publication of her many volumes of native language books, such as stories and also dictionaries. Vi Hilbert taught for 15 years at the University of Washington and three years at Evergreen College, and many of her students became Lushootsi teachers. She shared her native traditions with institutions such as the Burke Museum, the Seattle Art Museum, and United Indians of All Tribes, and she received many awards, including a major one from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Vi Hilbert spoke Lushootseed with every audience she addressed, especially traditional gatherings, so that this ancient language can be heard throughout Puget Sound, where it has been spoken for centuries. Vi Hilbert passed away in her home in La Conner in 2008 at the age of 90. Oh, I'm sorry. I was supposed to show you that. So you can see how it is written. I'm sorry, I can't. Can anyone pronounce that? Go to the Burke Museum. They have a beautiful new whole section on Native American languages. Anna Louise Strong is one of the most notable radical women journalists in the history of the United States. She was born in Nebraska in 1885, the daughter of middle-class liberals who were active in missionary work and the Congregational Church. A gifted child, she raced through public school and then studied languages in Europe. She graduated from Bryn Mawr College, did graduate work at Oberlin, and at age 23, rece received her PhD from the University of Chicago. As an advocate for child welfare, which there weren't very many advocates then, for the Uni United States Education Office, she organized an exhibit and toured it extensively throughout the United States and abroad. And when she brought that exhibit to Seattle, for six months, in May of, starting in May of 1914, it attracted more than 6,000 people a day, mostly women visitors. Unable to find solutions to the needs of children and the working class, Strong concluded that capitalism was at fault and became an avowed socialist. She was 30 years old, when she returned to Seattle to live with her father, the Reverend Sidney Strong, pastor of the Queen Anne Congregational Church. She favored the Seattle political climate at the time, 
which was pro-labor and progressive. She also enjoyed mountain climbing and led climbing parties up Mount Rainier. When Strong ran for the Seattle School Board in 1916, she won easily thanks to the support from women's groups and organized labor and her reputation as an expert on child welfare. She was the only female board member of the school board. And she argued that schools should offer social service programs for underprivileged children and that they should serve as community centers. But the other school board members disagreed. In the year of her election, 1916, the Everett massacre occurred. Strong was hired as a stringer for the New York Evening Post to report on this bloody conflict between the international workers of the world, which we call the Wobblies, and the army of armed guards hired by Everett mill owners to keep them out of town. At first she was an impartial observer, but she soon became an impassioned spokesperson for workers' rights. Strong's endorsement of controversial liberal causes set her, her apart from others on the school board. She opposed war as a pacifist, and when the United States entered World War I in 1917, she spoke out against the, ja the general draft. On one hand, the PTA and women's clubs joined her in opposing military training in the schools. On the other hand, groups of military veterans branded her as unpatriotic. Strong's fellow school board members were quick to launch a recall campaign against her and they won by a narrow margin. So she was off the school board. Strong became more openly associated with the liberal press, writing forceful pro-labor articles and promoting the new Soviet government. In 1919, two days before the Seattle general strike, she proclaimed her support for the strike, which sh shut down the city for four days, but ended as it began, peacefully and with its goals still undefined. Dis disillusioned with the indecision of the labor movement, Strong began to travel as a foreign correspondent for radical American newspapers. Look at this photo. I'll explain that in just a second. In the late 1920s and into the 1930s, Strong ventured into China, parts of Asia, and throughout the Soviet Union. This is the 1930s. She went to all those places, interviewing ordinary workers and people in the street as well as senior Soviet leaders. She visited Spain in 1937 during the Spanish Civil War and accompanied the victorious Soviet Red Army into Poland and Berlin in 1945. And she visited China during the latter stages of the War of Liberation there in 1949. After World War II, Strong was arrested in the US on espionage charges. She was eventually freed and after another visit to the USSR, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, which is no longer around, when she went there, after she went there in 1955, she settled in China in 1958 at the age of 72. And here she was one of the few Western journalists to gain the admiration of Chairman Mao Zedong. Here's a photo of her with Chairman Mao so you can see she's the one in the middle, and other Chinese revolutionary leaders, and the African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois in 1959. She died there in China in 1970 at the age of 85, having written more than 30 books based on her journalistic career, her journalistic work. And now we have a short uh, music video. This is about Ruby Bishop, not about him. <laughs> Let's tickle some ivories now. Please welcome local jazz legend Ruby Bishop. <laughs> I never made it 
Ruby Bishop, the legendary jazz singer and pianist, was born Ruby Carol Cogwell in 1919 in the town of Rochester in Thurston County. Okay, who knows where Rochester is? South of Olympia. And she lived among many black pioneer families, successful black pioneer families. Some of you may know that the city of Centralia was founded by a well-known black businessman, George Washington. She was the eighth child and she worked on the family farm and dancing for country fairs at age five and mostly self-taught on the piano. She led the Centralia Buccaneers band at the age of 12. After graduating from high school, her parents sent her to the University of Washington, where they hoped that she would become a pharmacist. Within a year, she left the university to start her music career. Settling in Seattle in the 1930s, Bishop played solo gigs at many of Seattle's well-known jazz venues, and one of her big influences who she met and worked with was the piano player Fats Waller who invented the stride piano. And this is an example of stride piano style, a kind of ragtime music style. And because of restrictions imposed by the white musicians union, black performers were limited to the south part of town around Jackson Street. This restricted area was where touring jazz greats could stay, perform, and hang out. And over the years, Bishop befriended and hosted many of these performers who looked forward to not only her great music, but also her home-cooked meals. And these greats included Duke Ellington, Cab Calloway, and especially Louis Armstrong, whom she often escorted about town when he played in Seattle. Although she didn't become a pharmacist, she married a druggist, Alex Bishop, who had a shop in the International District, and I knew him in the early activist days. Wonderful man. And during World War II, like many women of her era, she became a Boeing B-17 mechanic and a draftsman. After the war, she learned stenotyping. Who still remembers what stenotyping was? In preparation for becoming a court reporter. Then she studied to be a beautician. She held many jobs to support her family. However, she always looked at her nighttime music career as her main profession. Over time, other re others recognized her musical ability. By the time she was in her 50s, Bishop had e achieved enough prominence to be recruited by the U.S. Army to entertain GI troops stationed in South Korea, and South Vietnam. By this point, she had also performed before audiences in London, Paris, and Stockholm. Despite that success, Bishop viewed Seattle as her home, and by the mid-70s, both national and international travel became less frequent. After her first husband died, Bishop married a second time at the age of 82. I'm not sure how many children she had, but she does have eight grandchildren. They live in the Mount Baker district near me. And after that husband died, she returned to performing regularly at Vito's Lounge over there on Madison Street, earning a spot in the Seattle Jazz Hall of Fame in 2016. She was 99 years old when she passed away this past June. There you go. Hula dancing and ragtime piano. No, oh, wait, uh, okay. So here are some questions. What does it mean to be a feminist 100 years ago and now? What barriers for women still exist? It is impossible to decide on a single definition for feminism because a woman's struggle to find a place in the world is rooted in and reflective of her own experience. Has contemporary American feminism primarily come to mean championing women's personal autonomy and challenging the privilege of male over female? More, this is the extra credit question. 
What can feminism mean for women in different cultural communities? What are different priorities and different barriers? What common goals can diverse women work on together? So those are your questions. Thank you. So actu actually, we can discuss anything. We don't have to name, uh, specifically refer to the questions, but any thoughts? Yes. Not on the question, but how did you choose the women that you <laughs> Everybody always asks me that. I had about 20 or 30 to choose from. It was hard, and the, we, you know, for this humanities thing, we apply and then we have to audition, and they went, that's too many. So um, I am interested in both arts and journalism because that's what I have been involved in. And also I want to represent women of color it, who have really achieved good, strong um, things and contributed to our, our communities. So I just had to keep narrowing it down. And somebody will always in the audience will always say, well, you didn't include so-and-so who was the head of our school board or school district. Uh, city council or something like that. And I said, these all are all artists and writers. And that's how I had to narrow it down. But it's all my choice. So anybody else can have another. OK, so I'll paraphrase the question, which has to do with um, uh, a writer, a certain writer's uh, idea that uh, er er many of the early feminists went on to support the early roots of the KKK, Ku Klux Klan, uh, based on the idea that that organization supported women's virtues and values. Anybody else want to answer that? I myself am not, not familiar with that book, and I am not familiar with that concept. Not in Seattle, no, not in Seattle, because we didn't have, uh, well, or until now, or maybe there are some hidden KKK up here. I, I think not in Seattle. But um, I think that the early feminists were suffragettes. They were in favor of suffrage. Many of them had a Christian background. And so it is possible that they looked to other organizations who also um, valued women and had strong values uh, for social uh, con control and maybe they, they thought that they would support those conservative organizations. Uh, I think there were many others who were more on the um, left-hand side of the political spectrum who did not believe that the KKK stood for values that they believed in, especially race matters. Okay, let me just repeat that for the camera, and that is the comment that in the early days, the KKK was considered anti-Catholic, and that, that may have appealed to some of the uh, Christian women supporters of the KKK. Yes, uh, so the question was on uh, not just white women gaining the right to vote, but what happened with the rights to vote for uh, other women of color. Um, in our state, black males were given, no, nationally, the black males were given the right to vote in two constitutional amendments in 1868 and 1870. So they could vote, that's black males, could vote in Washington state. Now, I'm not sure how uh, closely that was monitored because black women then should have received the right to vote in 1910 along with all women in our state. So that is one area of question I haven't answered. The other thing is that Native Americans, men and women, got the right to vote in 1887 if they forswore their tribal affiliation. That's in our state. That rule ended in 1924 and all Native Americans got the right to vote regardless of their tribal affiliation, that's not until 1924. So that's even after the national suffrage. Um, but there are a lot of fine details, and I would, before anyone quotes me on that and pu republishes that, please look up your information. Yes. 
Uh, I'm just going to paraphrase that to say that there was, uh, there has been over time divisive pe time periods between black men and white women over the rights to vote for their various uh, constituencies, but there's definitely many shades of political points of view. You can't not just say the white feminists all thought one thing and the black men, all lead, black men leaders all thought something else. Could you address the rural West voting for women first? Well, why do you think that it was Western states? I think the men respected their women because they were out there working on the farm and running the farm and running the children and the animals and the, so the rural West became the, the first area where women had the right to vote. Uh, I think you, you were. I was going to ask the same question. Okay, but you, you all have opinions. Anybody else want to? But I, I do think that um, the Western states males, um, that they value women uh, more than Eastern states men. I don't know about that. I think the Western states men are very patriarchal. The Western states men are patriarchal. Yes, yeah, so I, I don't, I think there must be some other reasons why, some more practical reasons why they gave rights to women or even Eastern states. It, it's possible that the West, in the Western states there was not as much regard for religion, organized religion, when people are working hard on their farms. But uh, I think, oh, yes. Uh, the, in the West, uh, uh, rural areas, the, the men were vitally dependent upon the cooperation of the woman uh, in their pioneering enterprise. Yeah. They were dependent. Mm -hmm. the, the men were, were vitally dependent on the women uh, partners and wives in their pioneering enterprises. I had to repeat that. Yes. I always look for follow the money on this. <laughs> And I think it's possible, somebody would have to study this, that women uh, had a higher representation of property ownership and business practice in the West that were allowed to do that. Uh, they couldn't. They couldn't own property? They couldn't own property, property, property. property. I wonder if they were often um, widowed this happened. Correct. And that, then uh, they, yeah. Well, the question is whether they were able to own property before they gained the right to vote. I mean, because we're talking about way back in 1883, but possibly, yeah, poss possibly that was true. It's another good thing to, to figure out. Okay. Uh huh. I thought it was a recruitment thing, is to get women to come west. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I know this. I mean, uh -huh. it, was, it was explicitly if stated. They thought about this. I things. can't remember what state. No, I, I think it's Wyoming. They had like no women. Yes, right. I think it's because all it the men be were out there working the land. They needed to bring more women in. Yeah. And they so decided so to give them a the way of right promising that they would respect women when they got there. as a sweetener. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so that comment had to do with possibly encouraging women to come and populate these western states because they had the right to vote. Yes. Also, people in the western states were homesteading a lot. They were getting that 360 acres. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then they couldn't, there was times when they weren't really making it there. Like, like in the time of my grandmother, she went and taught the school. My grandfather, this was in Montana, went to town to work. She ran the farm. She did all of that. I mean, she was an equal partner in all of it. And I think a lot of men had that situation going on. And she was, you know, considered a really good business woman from the time of being a young woman. So, I mean, there was a lot more equality because you had to get in there and work or it wasn't going to happen. You weren't going to own that homestead. You were going to keep it. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yes. I've forgotten the I'm name sorry. of the woman that lived out her years in China. And a little strong. Strong. Yeah, strong. You said she published a great deal. Yes. When she was in China. Well, uh, yes. I mean, she could send her her uh, manuscripts to publishers in so both the U.S. So they published in English. I, well, I think it was published in English, but 
books at that time also were translated into different languages. What were, were these uh, political texts? Well, based on her, her travels, so therefore some of them had to do with interviewing directly people and Soviet leaders, and others were more like travel logs. But definitely her journalistic work meant to um, cover the actual battles and revolutions and uh, changes in, in government uh, from the people's revolutions. I mean, she had that t point of view, so. Many of them were translated into different languages. Uh, if you um, look her up now, you can find many, many titles, and probably you can see what languages they were published in. She's one of the most well-published early women writers in the world, really. Yes? Based on your research, what's your definition of feminism, and did it evolve as you did the research? I feel like I've been doing, been doing this research you know, all my life. Uh, I grew up with three brothers. Uh, I feel like my dad, um, the artist George Sudakawa, treated us pretty equally, and I feel like you know, I was encouraged to study and do what I wanted to do, become active in community activities and so on. But um, so... I always believed in the importance of the um, organizing and empowering the women of color um, way back since the uh, 1970s, and that's always been important to me. Over the years, you know, I had a career in arts management, Washington State Arts Commission and King County Arts Commission through the years. So arts became a way of um, empowering everyone or expressing everyone's voices. So that has been really rewarding over time. But now I feel like there still isn't equality in representation. And if you look at the list of speakers and topics in the Speakers Bureau, there are 30 speakers in the Humanities Washington Speakers Bureau. And I said my previous topic, which was quite popular about the history of Japanese Americans and my family's 100-year history was very popular. But I decided, damn it, we really have to keep up a positive force in bringing women's voices to the screen, even if it's just five. So I hope that other people, women, such as this a scholar here who d introduced herself to me, I hope that you all speak up and in an organized fashion and not just you know, go march in the street, but publish and, you know, prepare lectures and become speakers with Humanities Washington. It's really important to do that. As those uh, women deselected from this presentation, were there some Koreans? Did I originally consider Koreans? Um, if they lived in Washington in the 1920s and 30s. So unfortunately, there was not very much consideration because this is meant to be a 100-year-old look at Washington State. Now, when I redo this talk in more mod contemporary time, definitely I would include Koreans <laughs> and Filipinos and Vietnamese and, you know. Yes. Do you know very much about um, uh, Seattle's female, other female mayor? Bertha you mean Landis. Bertha Landis? Yeah. Did she... If she wasn't an artist or writer, then I did not spend time studying her. But she is a notable, a notable pioneer in the, amongst elected officials. Maybe others of you know more about Bertha Landis. Yeah, I read about her. Um, she was a one-term mayor, and what happened was the women's clubs, of which there were many, organized around her candidacy and basically got her into office one time. One After time. that, they, the, yeah. you know, the establishment figured it out, and uh, uh, the women's club did not have such a powerful voice after that. Mm -hmm. um, you bring up a really important point about the women's clubs. There has been so much organizing and uh, uh, important work addressing different issues in the home and 
social welfare and so on by women's clubs. But it hasn't necessarily translated into political power and economic power through this 100 years that I'm talking about in Washington state. There are lot, many, many more women elected officials now, which is, and they're, they represent many different communities, which is good. But uh, I think it's been a struggle for women to be candidates and to take the top leadership positions. I don't know what's going to happen with our national elec elections, but it's good that there's, you know, there are a lot more now. So no, I didn't study about Bertha Landis. <laughs> okay, I think that we've just about hit everything. And uh, I want to thank you for coming. I'll stay here for a little while in case you want to talk or um, communicate with me. So thank you so much for coming.